As much as we appreciate the incredible biodiversity of Sri Lanka, it is after all part of one of the world's 25 biodiversity hotspots. We rarely stop to think about where this incredible diversity came from in the first place. We are handicapped because Sri Lanka has a very poor fossil record. All the fossils we have found up to now in Sri Lanka date to just a few tens of thousands of years. And this means that we have a fairly good idea of the animals that lived on the island during the last ice age, for example, you've obviously heard about the hippopotamus, the rhinoceros, and the lion and tiger and so on that are supposed to have lived on the island, uh, known from these recent uh, fossils that have been found. But truly ancient fossils from millions of years ago have never really been found on the island except for very small deposits that are not very informative. But we can take it for granted that most of the diversity on Sri Lanka came to us from India, indeed as humans did a few tens of thousands of years ago. But where did plants and animals get into India from? They must have come either from Southeast Asia or from Africa. Humans, after all, left Africa 120,000 years ago and they managed to get to Australia by 60,000 years ago, so they must have been in Sri Lanka by then. But there's ways of plants and animals getting across the world other than by dispersing on land. You've all seen images like these of rafts of vegetation flowing down rivers into the sea during times of heavy rainfall. These rafts can carry small animals, they can carry other plants. Sometimes the rafts can be big, several acres in extent, and travel very long distances overseas to get from one place to another. Birds and bats and so on, avian fauna, can also uh, carry uh, organisms, whether unwittingly on their feet, for example, or uh, undigested food in their, in their mouths or gullets. But to understand Sri Lanka's biogeography, I think it's best to start looking at it from the perspective of the, f the first, the early workers who studied this subject. As you know, when the colonial powers first came to the island in the 16th century, they came largely in the pursuit of cinnamon and black pepper, trying to corner a market that until then had belonged to Moorish traders across the Arabian Sea or the Chinese further eastwards. The Portuguese never took much interest in exploring the country. They, they were just traders who wanted a monopoly on the spice trade. But by the time the Dutch replaced them in the 17th century in Sri Lanka and southern India, they began to look for other plants of medicinal interest because they discovered several plants in South America by then that were of substantial uh, commercial importance. And so the Dutch governor of the Malabar province in, in South India, in present-day Kerala, a man called Hendrik van Rede, made the first investigation of the plants of Kerala. He compiled this book, Hortus Malabaricus, hundreds of beautiful plates of plants, um, and evaluated the flora of this incredibly biodiversity rich, the richest part of the peninsula of India, as it happens. Not to be outdone, his counterpart in Colombo uh, commissioned a Dutch physician in, in Colombo, Paul Herman, to explore the plants of Sri Lanka and Herman made a collection in the western province. He couldn't go further inland because the King of Kandy prevented uh, the, the Dutch from entering his kingdom. But this collection made by Herman, hundreds of specimens of plants from the western province became the foundation of Sri Lankan botany and Herman's book came to be published in 1717. Uh, another book by Johann Berman came to be published in 1737, pretty much working on part of Hermann's collection. And the great Carl Linnaeus followed up in 1747 with his Flora Zelanica, uh, the kind of founder book of Sri Lankan botany. So in the space of just three decades, between 1717 and 1747, three important books on the flora of Sri Lanka came to be published in Europe. This indicates the interest in the tropical flora of Sri Lanka that was then burgeoning 
in Europe. So when the British got there, they inherited that legacy. And by then, the Dutch had begun a botanic garden in, in Slave Island in Colombo. And this, these pages show you a entry from the journal from 1817 from the Slave Island Botanic Garden indicating that the British kept meticulous records not just of what was growing there but also meteorological data and information on the adaptability of soils and so on. The British also felt that there were plants of potential interest when they saw Sri Lanka's incredible plant diversity they quickly appreciated that there were probably plants of interest, whether, whether plants like had been discovered in South America, rubber, uh, cinchona, and so on, or plants of medicinal interest, because Sri Lanka had this rich tradition of uh, indigenous medicine. So they established a, a herbarium in Peradeniya, which is still there today as the National Herbarium, and commissioned artists like Harmanis de Alves Seneviratna to draw the plants of Sri Lanka. And three generations of Harmanis, his, his sons and his grandsons, uh, were recruited to this enterprise throughout the, the whole of the 19th century and drew thousands of Sri Lankan plants. By the early part of the 19th century, the superintendent of the Peradeniya Gardens, Alexander Moon, was able to publish the first catalogue of Ceylon plants. It was very tentative, but importantly published both in English and Singhala, probably the first scientific book to be published in Singhala as well. And then uh, George Thwaites, in the middle part of the century, completed substantially the collection of plants all over Sri Lanka. And finally, in the last decade of the 19th century, Henry Trimmon came to publish his five-volume Flora of Ceylon, which is still the staple of Sri Lankan botany. Trimmon's work was hugely important because he mentioned also the uh, places where these plants were found. So this meant that he had uh, herbarium specimens which said, for example, found on the top of Ritigala or found in uh, Haggala or found in Singaraja. So these records enabled the distributions of plants to be mapped and comparisons to be made between the floras, for example, of the dry zone and the wet zone. And fortuitously, the same thing was going on in India. So Joseph Dalton Hooker, uh, Trimmon's counterpart in India, much bigger region, wrote the flora for the whole of British India. That's present day India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Myanmar, Nepal, this vast subcontinental region. But the British were disappointed that having done all this work, they found almost no plants of truly substantial commercial importance. And so they did what colonial powers always do. They cut down all the forest and they planted the crops with which you are so familiar. But Trimmon was an astute scientist, he was an exceptional man, and he analyzed his data uh, as a comparison of the Ceylon flora with the flora of the region at large, with Madagascar, Africa, India, and Southeast Asia. And he made some remarkable uh, observations, very astute observations. He found, for example, that while the highland flora of Sri Lanka, the flora of the Horton Plains, if you will, is closely related with the highland flora of southern India, the flora of the Nilgiris, for example. There's, there's a close relationship between the flora of Horton Plains and that of the Shola forests of the Nilgiris. This wasn't true for the lowland forests, places like Singaraja, Karnelia, Kottava, Hinidoma, and so on. Those lowland forests had plants that showed closer relationships to the flora of Southeast Asia, places like Sumatra, Borneo, and so on. And he was at a loss to understand this. How, how can Sri Lanka have these very distant relationships with, uh, in, in terms of plants and not with India that was right next door? As Trimmon explored the flora, he found more and more genera of plants in Sri Lanka that were altogether absent from India dozens of them, and we, we know several examples, maybe 30 or 40 today. And these plants occur in Sri Lanka, they're absent from India, but you get 
their closest relatives, South Africa, Madagascar, Socotra, China, Australia, New Zealand, and so on, far-flung places. And this was difficult to square with his understanding of how the flora of Sri Lanka might have evolved. So these dozens of genera that are absent from India was always a conundrum uh, that was left un unanswered for a long time. And then you have these rainforest species that are so important in Sri Lanka, like Trichodenia and Axinandra, which occur in the Sri Lankan rainforest and altogether absent from India and recurring only in Southeast Asia, in Southern Peninsula Malaysia, in Sumatra, in Borneo, and so on. Now, I don't want you running away with the idea that the British in Sri Lanka were looking at this purely as scientists. They, their interests were purely extractive. And that's nowhere better displayed than when it came to the case of zoology. Because they felt that there was no value commercially in zoology. They never invested any money in exploring Sri Lanka's zoology. They, they saw that beetles and bugs and mice and shrews had no relevance to making money for the British Empire. And so it came to be that in 1777, when they established the Colombo Museum, the museum was dedicated almost wholly to art, to history, to ethnography, uh, archaeology, and so on, and not to natural history, not to zoology. Zoology, in fact, was is consigned to an outhouse, but maintained a foothold because of the interest of the interest in the pearl fishery. I'll come to that in a minute. So when the first zoological compilation on the fauna of Ceylon came to be published in 1852 by Edward Frederick Kellart, a Sri Lankan physician of Dutch descent, who did this entirely in his private capacity as, as an amateur, the British, and for that matter the Sri Lankan governments, never really invested in the fauna as they did in the flora. I myself am one of that lineage of amateurs. I'm an engineer studying biology as a hobby. The one exception in the British time was the pearl fishery in Aripo. This was a hugely valuable part of the economy for the British as it had been for the Sri Lankan kings for millennia. And so they invested a lot of time and money in making sure that the pearl fishery was going to be sustainable. So it was the only area of science in which they really invested. Um, and as it happened, as luck would have it, the pearl fishery collapsed by 1916 when Mikimoto patented the uh, culture of pearls artificially so that pearls could be uh, created almost without limit. But so important was the fishery that when the first British governor, Frederick North, s uh, built himself a mansion in, in Aripo to supervise the uh, the fishery with, and Georges Bizet, the French composer, made Doric House, the setting for his uh, well-known opera, The Pearl Fishers, which was set uh, in Manor. But while all this was going on, another man, quietly in the jungles of Borneo, Alfred Russell Wallace, was exploring the animals. And he came to realize some remarkable things about the distribution of animals worldwide. Wallace was a genius. He was a contemporary of Darwin's. He discovered uh, evolution by natural selection in his own right. Of course, Darwin got, got priority because Darwin had done a huge amount of work on it. But Russell had made the discovery about the same time. And Russell discovered that the faunas of the various regions of the world are quite characteristic. They show common elements within these regions, for example, the Australasian region um, in yellow here, whereas the many of those animals, like the marsupials, for example, don't extend into the oriental region, which is in pink, and which Sri Lanka is part of. And Wallace also came across these disjunctions, that the, the fact that species occur in one place and then are absent for a big area and then recur in another place. An example of this would be the butterfly genus idea. It occurs in the rainforest of Sri Lanka, the moist forests of southernmost India, and then again only in southern tropical Southeast Asia, in Sumatra, Borneo, and southern peninsula Malaysia. There's even 
a, a species of fish in Sri Lanka, Belontia signata, uh, a freshwater fish known as Talkosa because they're very pugnacious. And its closest relative occurs not anywhere in India or Myanmar or Thailand, but again in that same tropical Southeast Asian region. And there's only two species in this genus, one in Sri Lanka and one in tropical Southeast Asia. How do you explain these disjunctions? So this, this is something that vexed biologists for a very long time. And then you get groups of animals like these rainforest snails in Sri Lanka, Acavus. The family Acavidae doesn't occur in India. It's in Sri Lanka's rainforest and then it recurs on various Indian Ocean islands such as Madagascar. The same is true for this group of spiders, uh, relatives of daddy long legs, the petalid spiders. They occur in Sri Lanka, they're absent from the whole of India, but they're found in Madagascar. The same is true of the clititrine spiders as well. They are absent from India, present in wet Sri Lanka, and then found in Africa and Madagascar. Some of these rainforest groups occur in southwestern Sri Lanka, in the wet part of Sri Lanka, also in the wet part of southernmost India, for example, this group of pill millipedes. And then, nowhere else in Asia, their nearest relatives are on Madagascar. I'm sure you'd have seen water beetles, these cascade beetles you find commonly at the foot of waterfalls, in, in, the, in the roiling water at the bottom of a waterfall. Scoliopsis. They occur in Sri Lanka, southernmost India, and then their sister group, their, their closest relatives, occur on Madagascar. But the thing is, none of these groups I've mentioned are tolerant of salt water. So how did they span this enormous region, 4,000 kilometers, the width of the continental United States? How did they span this huge expanse of sea uh, to, to get across it? There are other examples also in the world of fish. The angel fishes, I, I, I'm using this slide because I think you're familiar with angel fishes, which, which are common in freshwater aquariums. They come from South America, where there's a few hundred species of chiclid fishes, the family to which they belong. Then Africa's got, of course, huge diversifications of chiclid fishes in the Great Lakes, um, but also the, the tilapias, which I'm, I suspect you've heard of. In Sri Lanka and India, there are three species of chiclid fishes, and it turns out that their closest relatives are not anywhere else in Asia, but on Madagascar. But chiclids are freshwater fishes. They, none of the species, there's more than a thousand species, none of them occurs in the sea. And so we have to uh, think about how these disjunctions might have come about. There's other examples. For example, the tree frogs. I mean, these are the most common frogs in, in Sri Lanka. You've all heard them. They're quite noisy. When it rains, they, they sing. There's almost 100 species in, in Sri Lanka of these racophorid frogs, and they go all the way across Asia up to Japan. Funnily enough, their closest relatives are not in Asia. Their closest relatives are in Madagascar. The same is true for dozens of groups of plants. I'm using this example of the proteaceae because you're probably familiar with proteas. You, you find them commonly in flower arrangements and I've seen uh, the one in, in the center, for example, the center bottom um, proteas for sale from South Africa, from the Finbos region for sale in BP filling stations in the UK. They occur in the southern continents and a single species of Helicea a proteus plant, occurs in the rainforest of Sri Lanka and southernmost India. Then again, it's absent for the rest of India until you get to Southeast Asia. How did these disjunctions come about? This conundrum was there and couldn't be solved before two things happened. One is because most of these species aren't represented properly in the fossil record. Uh, we, we only know about their relationships properly now because molecular biology has allowed uh, phylogenies to be constructed for these, which can be timed. Molecular clocks can be used and calibrated against known fossils to find roughly what times these plants diverged or animals diverged. And at the same time, 
Another important discovery came to be made in 1912 by Af Alfred Wegener, a German scientist, who proposed the theory of continental drift. This theory had been floating around for a long time, but Wegener put it into a very cogent argument. Fitting the continents together in logical shapes, though he was unable to explain how this, what, what mechanism drove the continents to drift. So in the absence of an explanation, the theory went into disuse for a long time. But then Wegener produced this piece of work at a very important time. It was the early part of the 20th century when oil exploration was beginning all over the world because of the commercial importance of oil. And these drilling rigs all over the seas of the world because people were looking for uh, oil in shelf seas throughout the, the globe. The cores that came out, the geological cores that came out were examined by geologists who were able to piece together a historical map of the world from geological relationships. And this gave us the first evidence that we're going to have been right. Now we know of much more evidence, the, the spreading of the sea floor, uh, hydrothermal vents, and so on. So we can now reconstruct the planet as it was, for example, in the time of the dinosaurs. You're all familiar with Jurassic Park. And if we cast our mind back 150 million years, we can get to a reconstruction of how the planet looked then. Here, which I've outlined in red, is India. And in solid red at the bottom here is where Sri Lanka was. India and Sri Lanka were then orientated 90 degrees clockwise of their present orientation. And in the space of that last 150 million years, they've gradually swiveled anti-clockwise by about 90 degrees. And as we examine the position of Sri Lanka at that time, 130 million years ago, for example, we were wedged between Antarctica and India. Madagascar was wedged between India and Africa. And now you can begin to see how those disjunctions might have occurred. In the case of Sri Lanka and India, we have really good geological evidence which shows the close, close relationships. And Sri Lanka was at that time much closer to India than it is now. And we've slowly been drifting away um, since, since then. So here's the picture 143 million years ago. And now if we look at reconstructions coming more recently, you can see India's breaking away from Antarctica. And Sri Lanka, India, and Madagascar have now started drifting up the Indian Ocean, which we refer to at that time as the Tethys Ocean. By about 90 million years ago, India had broken away from Madagascar, and now India and Sri Lanka begin this long journey across the Tethys until India collides with Asia around 55 million years ago, giving rise to the Himalayas, and then the trajectory continues up to the present. And we brought with us this flora as we rafted northwards towards Asia. But, of course, bad things happen. And in our case, they happened twice. Around 66 million years ago, when we were roughly where I've shown us here, a meteor several kilometers, tens of kilometers wide, it might have been a comet, it crashed into Earth with tremendous force in the region of the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. This, this region here, and you can see where we are at the time. The energy released by this massive impact was equivalent to about 100 million thermonuclear bombs. It was the biggest catastrophe the world has seen, had seen for hundreds of millions of years. And with it, 75% of the plant and animal species on the planet were made extinct. So it was a, a horrible thing to have happened to biodiversity, but humans probably wouldn't be here if not for that, because that calamity took out the dinosaurs. And that's why dinosaurs are seen today only in natural history museums. 
As if that weren't bad enough, we had a second disaster, a massive burst of volcanism on India, centered around the region of Mumbai, which released about a million cubic kilometers of lava onto India. If you think about a million cubic kilometers, it, it's like burying the United Kingdom, the whole of the UK, under 5,000 meters of lava. A huge volume of lava. And so this double whammy had the effect of wiping out most of the biodiversity on India and Sri Lanka. On Sri Lanka, we don't know of many vertebrate groups that survived. Of course, the blind snakes probably did the Gyropylidae. They live mostly underground, feeding on worms and things that they find underground. And so they might have been protected. The giant scorpions live in leaf litter in the forest and they might have been protected as might those petalid spiders I told you about. Similarly, the pill millipedes and these scoliopsis um, beetles, the water beetles, might have been protected by underground water systems. There seems to have been one species of ant on Sri Lanka that's really important that survived, but we're not still sure whether it actually came to Sri Lanka after we met with Asia or whether it was there before. It, it might have been after. Uh, Anuritus simoni. It's, it's unusual amongst the world's 4,000 species of ants, which are divided into 16 subfamilies, that this ant subfamily has only one species, and that species is found only in Sri Lanka. So it's, it's a remarkable element of global biodiversity that's represented in Sri Lanka's rainforests. And these ants live inside twigs, which might have given them some protection. And then there were, of course, a few plants. So the genus Hortonia, which is endemic to Sri Lanka, doesn't have any relatives in India, and it looks like some of these might have come from Africa or further afield uh, from the early times of the, the pre-impact uh, uh, arrangement of continents, but we're still not sure. On India, we have two charismatic examples of survivors of this, of this catastrophe. And both were discovered by friends of mine. The frog on the left, the bizarre looking frog, uh, Nasica batrachis, was discovered by Professor S.D. Biju at the University of New Delhi about 20 years ago. It's a separate family of frogs and it was one of the survivors of the great uh, calamities on, on India. And just three years ago, my colleague, uh, Professor Rajiv Raghavan in Kerala, uh, discovered the snakehead fish uh, at the top there and that too lives underground. It lives in the aquifers of Kerala and uh, it occasionally comes up into wells uh, which is how Rajiv came to discover it and he and his colleague Ralph Britz at the Senckenberg Museum in Germany uh, described this as a new family of fishes just uh, three years ago. So by the time India came to collide with Asia, India and Sri Lanka contained very little by way of vertebrate diversity, as far as we know, because of those catastrophes that had occurred. But after we made contact with Asia, it gave an opportunity for a massive influx of Asian plants and animals into India. And then, about 25 million years ago, Africa collided with Eurasia in the region of southern Iran, and this gave an opportunity for African plants and animals to sweep into Asia as well. But the traffic, of course, wasn't one way. There were plants and animals that went from Asia also into Africa. And my colleague Hiranya Sudhasinghe has been doing some work on a group of fishes called Systomus, which, which you might be familiar because these occur commonly in the Manic Ganga. And if you've ever been throwing uh, crumbs in the river, either in Yala or in Kataragama, you'd, you'd see these chunky six, eight inch long fishes coming and demanding more in large shoals. And about 20, 25 million years ago, a ancestor of today's Systomus dispersed into Africa and diversified into 200 and something species, the African small barbs we call them now. And some of these African small barbs look remarkably like the uh, Sri Lankan species even though they are so distantly related. So this huge influx of plants and animals got into India, but 
what were the conditions under they could now get into Sri Lanka? Two things had to happen. First of all, sea levels had to go down from time to time to enable a terrestrial uh, land bridge to occur between India and Sri Lanka. This happened many times, of course, because the Pork Strait is so shallow. Even today, it's too shallow for shipping. And if sea level goes down by 5 or 10 meters, you get a quite sizable land bridge to India, as you can see here. But it also took climate, which I'll come to next. So as you can see from this graph, if the sea level goes down by even 20 meters, you get a land bridge that's wider than 150 kilometers. That's roughly the distance from Putlam to Trincomalee. And here you see in this graph, uh, present day sea level in the flat line, the red line. But throughout the last ice age, for example, the last 120,000 years, you can see that sea level was almost throughout that period substantially lower than it is now, giving rise to this wide land bridge across which animals could have dispersed between India and Sri Lanka. So when humans first came to Sri Lanka, what, 60,000 years ago, they, they walked. They didn't need seagoing craft. Cast your mind further back to the last two and a half million years, the, the, the Pleistocene broadly. And even in that period, sea levels were substantially low for much of the time, giving rise to a land bridge, so that plants could, uh, and animals could disperse over land. And even going further back to the Pliocene, there were many episodes in which sea levels were low enough for the land bridge to occur. So while the land bridge was there for much of the time, there was another problem that had to be overcome, and that was the problem of climate. As you know, Mana is about the driest place in Sri Lanka. It receives barely a thousand millimeters of, uh, of rain a year. A thousand millimeters in the UK is quite a lot. That's, that's more than you receive on, on average uh, in a year. And the reason for the UK not being a semi-desert like the Adams Bridge region, for example, is, is because it's much cooler and there's less evaporation. And also, the rainfall is much better distributed. You have rain almost every week, which is a good thing because it gives you something to talk about while waiting for the bus. In Sri Lanka, the situation is different. In the dry zone, rainfall tends to be concentrated on the last three months of the year. October, November, December. The other months are relatively dry and no month usually, or certainly no consecutive months, receive more than 100 millimeters of rainfall. So if you look at some typical stations, dry zone on top, wet zone at the bottom in Sri Lanka, you see this immediately. The dry zone has many consecutive months in which rainfall is less than 100 millimeters. In the wet zone, that doesn't happen. The wet zone is perpetually wet. So the wet zone is not called the wet zone because it receives more rainfall, more absolute rainfall. It's because it has no rainfall seasons. There are no real dry months. And if you look at the map of global rainfall, you can see this. This is Sri Lanka in February, our driest month throughout the country. And this intertropical convergence zone, which is the region of highest rainfall across the equator, which goes all across the planet, is at its southmost extremity at that time. Then, as the summer progresses and the sun moves further north, the belt of rainfall moves further north. Now, I've also put a red dot here against Singapore so that you get an idea for what happens at a lower latitude than Sri Lanka, slightly lower. Singapore is about five degrees more south of Sri Lanka. And it's even in its driest period, it stays within the rainfall belt. So as a result of that, Singapore has a rainfall pattern like this. There's no real dry months uh, ever. So if you look at the trajectory of the rainfall belt as the summer progresses in Sri Lanka and Singapore, you can see the rainfall moves progressively northwards. And then as the northeast monsoon sets in and the sun starts moving further south, it comes down to the uh, position we find in our driest month in, in February. So the thing I think to realize as to why Sri Lanka's southwest wet zone is so important 
is because it's unique in the whole of South Asia. There's no other perhumid climate in the whole of South Asia. Perhumid meaning that there's no dry months. To find another spot like this, you've got to go westwards as far as equatorial Africa or eastwards as far as Sumatra. There's nothing in the whole of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Myanmar, Thailand and so on. So Sri Lanka is very unique and very fragile because the wet zone is so small and so important because it harbors this incredible diversity of plants and animals. These trees that characterize our wet zone forests, uh, the Dipterocarpaceae, the hull tree is one of these and you might have heard of hull mull for example. We have 50 endemic species in Sri Lanka. As you go northwards in India, the Dipterocarpaceae gradually disappear, but then they recur in huge diversity on Sumatra, Borneo and southern ben peninsular Malaysia. So if you look at this annual weather pattern and the rainfall moving north and south, you get a feel for how fragile Sri Lanka is, because if this belt were to be pushed substantially further south, we might enter a long dry period in February, threatening the entirety of our rainforest biodiversity. So were the northeast monsoon to strengthen or the southwest monsoon to weaken, we might have a serious problem on our hands. And we know that this is happening already. If you look at the climate records from the last 150 years, you see a steady decline in rainfall in many places in Sri Lanka and especially on the western slopes of the highlands. In Norelia, for example, there's been a 20% decline in rainfall over the last century and a half. Because the first intermonsoon, the rains that come about this time of the year in, in April, is weakening. So the, the reduction in rainfall is happening at exactly the time that we don't want it to happen, during our dry period. We don't mind a little less rainfall in our wettest period, but right now it's becoming dangerously close to that point at which our rainforest might tip into uh, a more dry forest type. Of course, the increase in global temperature of a degree Celsius in the last century is not helping either, and this is predicted to go up some more. So we really don't know, we can't model what's going to happen, but um, we're not really going to focus on that right now. What's relevant to our argument is between 30 and 20 million years ago, Sri Lanka was transitioning across the equator because Sri Lanka and India, of course, were moving north towards Asia. So we were at this kind of position where Sri Lanka was around where Singapore is or even a bit further south. And that meant that we had much wetter climate throughout the country. So rainforests could extend throughout the whole of Sri Lanka whole of southern India and whenever sea levels were low across the isthmus that connected Sri Lanka to India, the pork isthmus. So we had this hugely wet climate and it was during that time that many of the groups we associate with unique and ancient en endemism in Sri Lanka came into the island. The fish like Bellontia and Cystomus that I mentioned but also these groups of things like the horned lizards, uh, Ceratophora, Lyriocephalus, Cofortis, and these, this remarkable diversification of frogs had its common ancestor arrive in the island 28 million years ago or so, according to the work done by my colleague, uh, Professor Madhava Megaskumura. Uh, and we, we have this huge influx of rainforest adapted plants and animals coming into the country during that window. And then, as the Miocene period progressed, it kept reducing. So the last freshwater crabs, for example, to cross the pork isthmus from India to Sri Lanka was about seven and a half million years ago. The last time we know of a frog, uh, a tree frog, crossing the pork isthmus was about nine million years ago and this time from India to Sri Lanka. And so we come to understand Trimmons original discovery of this disjunct flora between Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia and Sri Lanka and Madagascar, for example, uh, with in, in the new light of these discoveries. We, we now can understand how these divergences took place. On the one hand, continental drift, 
and on the other this uh, desiccation, the aridification of the Indian Peninsula over the last six million years. And that gives us a, a idea of, of the origins of Sri Lanka's biodiversity, driven by continental drift originally and largely by sea level and climate since then. So we have had periods from 30 million years ago until maybe 6, 10 million years ago when things were wet enough for almost all rainforest adapted species to get into Sri Lanka so long as sea levels were low. And then in the last 6 million years things got really difficult because the pork isthmus looks like it was getting progressively more and more arid. But I've up to now not been talking about the animals in which most people are interested. Elephants, leopards, bears and so on. These are probably all relatively recent entrants into Sri Lanka. They might have even come in the last uh, few hundred thousand years. We, we have no fossils from before then, so we don't really know. But from molecular analyses, we know that the crossings of the pork isthmus in, in the last million years or so have been extremely rare. Even animals adapted to life in the driest parts of southern India or northwestern Sri Lanka have found it difficult to cross from one side to the other. And that applies even to some birds. For example, the spotted owlet occurs throughout Asia, the whole of peninsular India, right up to the southern tip, but it never seems to have crossed into Sri Lanka. Similarly, the jungle fowl, the Ceylon jungle fowl, occurs throughout the island, including the driest parts of Sri Lanka, but never seems to have crossed into India. Of course, this might have been for ecological reasons and not just for climatic reasons. They might not have had niches in each other's countries, but uh, that's, that's a, another study. And this gives us a, a feel for how the plants and animals on Sri Lanka came to be. And it also gives us a context for the peril in which this remarkable biodiversity now finds itself. Because the wet zone is shrinking and becoming more seasonal, a dry period is extending into April, which is a big worry, and the wet zone forests have now shrunk because of human attrition. They've, they've shrunk to their lowest extent, probably for the past 150 million years. This is a very worrying phenomenon because the diversity that's contained in these forests is disappearing. Already dozens of plants have become extinct in Sri Lanka. We know of many frog species that have become extinct and so on in the last century. This is a matter of grave concern. And this map of forest distribution is from 40, 30, 40 years ago. It's not recent. And you know the kind of depredation that has been occurring to our forests in, in recent years. So things are not good and a lot more science needs to be invested in conservation. And amongst the people investing that science in conservation is my colleague Hiranya, so the singer whom I must acknowledge because he studies especially the biogeography and evolution of freshwater fishes, published an incredible number of papers in Sri Lanka already, he's not yet 30. Um, and so he's helped me to refine my ideas as I've presented them to you today. So that's pretty much what I wanted to say and if there are any questions I'd be happy to take them. Thank you.